Now we're going to look at the Egyptian prophecy. And the source of this prophecy comes from uh, two ancient Egyptian artifacts. The Egyptian Book of the Dead and the Great Pyramid in Giza. The Egyptian Book of the Dead is a collection of papyruses. Um, and you see a sample here of them talking about um, spiritual activity and also passages through something called the light. Um, initially, um, a man named Marsham Adams, reading Budge's translation of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, noticed that Budge had simply artificially titled it the Book of the Dead because the Tibetan Book of the Dead had been published recently and he liked the idea that he had the Egyptian Book of the Dead. But the truth was that the book was actually titled right in the uh, hieroglyphs, The Book of the Master of the Hidden Places. That was the real title of these uh, papyruses, this manuscript. Budge also, I mean, uh, Marsham Adams also noticed that in chapter 15, it started to talk about a thing called the light. And that fascinated him because it sounded like they were really talking about a structure and hallways and passageways through the structure. So he began to keep that in his mind and he started to realize that the chapters in the Egyptian Book of the Dead correlate to passageways in the pyramid. He first realized this when he looked at the original entrance to the Great Pyramid, not the one that we all use today to enter the pyramid, but just above it's the orig original entrance. And there's a glyph here called the Horizon of Heaven. And what comes through the Horizon of Heaven? The light. The light. And he realized, my goodness, particularly chapter 15, is one of the great Egyptologists, uh, Sir Gaston uh, Maspero, wrote, The pyramid and the book of the dead reproduce the same original, the one in words, the other in stone. And Edgar Cayce confirmed this. This is true. The layout of the great pyramid is a chronogram. Here's one of Edgar Cayce's readings. There are periods when even the hour, the day, year, place, country, nation, town, and individuals are pointed out. <laughs> How can you do that? How can we be looking at the thousand years into the future and know exactly who's going to do what, when, where? Is it is it all seen like that so much? Kind of like Jesus saying, every hair on your head is counted? Well, they better be recounting quickly because I'm losing some every day. It's an amazing idea that you could carve in stone the whole pathway into this realm and back out and everyone that's involved. And individuals are pointed out. That's how correct are many of those prophecies. All changes that came in the religious thought in the world are shown there in the pyramid chronograph in the variations in which the passage through same is reached from the base to the top or from the open tomb in the king's chamber to the top. David Davidson and H. Aldersmith read Marsham Adams' material, and in 1910, they went down to Egypt to check out the Great Pyramid and see if they truly could measure the prophecy. In about the 1930s, Edgar Cayce was asked about the work of H. Aldersmith and David Davidson, and he said, many of these deductions are correct. Many are far overdrawn. Only an initiate may understand. Here's David Davidson and H. Aldersmith's map of the prophecy chronograph in the Great Pyramid of Giza. As you see, the descending passageway is the descent out of heaven into matter, into the chamber of chaos. This type of lettering Davidson did 
because he was taking it directly out of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The name of what we call the pit or subterranean chamber. Notice this dotted line. That is the bedrock of the Giza Plateau upon which the pyramids built. So this shaft actually digs down into the bedrock and this is the subterranean chamber or pit. But the Egyptian Book of the Dead called it the Chamber of Chaos or Upside Downness. Fascinating uh, revelation into a shift in our awareness that was all backwards. We thought ourselves to be terrestrial beings instead of celestial. We thought life is material, matter, three dimensions instead of uh, the essence of life and celestial dimensions, limited, unlimited dimensions. Now the ascending passway, passageway back up is blocked by a giant granite plug, which the Egyptian Book of the Dead calls that first little location, the Gate of the Ascent. And the first passageway is called the Hall of Truth while still in darkness. So you don't know the whole story, but you're pursuing. Something's got to be more to this life than I'm seeing or feeling in the material paradigm that everyone is teaching me and that I'm trying to live in. There's got to be more to it. The Hall of Truth while still in darkness. Now, if you've ever been in the Great Pyramid, you can't go up this passageway without squatting into a low position and creeping your way up. It's very low. When Edgar Cayce was asked about that feature, he said, every time the initiates were forced to bend down, and to struggle through a passageway, it was to develop humility and meekness in them, to subdue self-centeredness, self-exaltation, and move you back into oneness and cooperation. So the long ascending passageway, very low, the hall of truth while in darkness. Now you get to the last step, and Davidson measured that date to be BC 4, and he wrote down the birth of uh, Christ. Now, for a long time we thought, why would it be B.C. 4? Until scholars, uh, not too long ago, discovered a document signed by Herod ordering the death of uh, all male children under one year of age. And the date he signed it was 4 B.C. Uh, and we realized, oh my goodness, uh, the child was born four years before we thought. And uh, Herod's men were out there trying to kill all of the male children born in that period of time. Now your head clears the passageway right here. And uh, Davidson uh, said that the, uh, it correlated it to the passage in the Book of the Dead that said, the crossing of the pure waters of life and the passion of the Messiah. There was a Messiah in the ancient Egyptian lore. Isis immaculately conceives the Messiah. Where have we heard that story before? In the ancient Egyptian legends, Isis ascends to heaven and cries out, we cannot leave these souls lost in the earth. Why are we withdrawing? Uh, let's help them. Let, let's try to help them. And um, her a uh, loving companion, Osiris, has been killed by his brother, Set, Seth, or Seti, Satan of ancient Egypt, and he rules, and she wants to subdue his rule and bring back to life the pureness of Osiris. Well, the heavenly boat of the gods comes down, and Hermes is on it, and he leans out of the boat of the gods and says, Isis, have you been so long with these people that you've lost touch with your own power and your connecting, connection to the celestial forces. She reflects on this and you see it on the wall where she throws her head back and she becomes instantly pregnant with the Messiah. Horus now is going to be born and he will eventually overthrow his uncle and subdue the darkness on the earth and bring back life. This is the marker in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, right there as your head clears. Davidson measured it to 30 and one quarter A.D., and he dated that as the date of the crucifixion. This was done in about 1910. Notice that the Queen's Chamber that we call in the Egyptian Book of the Dead is called the Chamber of the Second Birth. 
the chamber of the new birth. Wow, where have we heard this before? Remember Nicodemus sneaks away one night and asks Jesus for the mysteries, and the first one he tells him is, you must be born again. You must be born anew. You've been born physically, but now you must conceive in the womb of your consciousness who you really are, your spiritual self. You must gestate that, nourish it, give life to it, and birth it, and become the spiritual person temporarily sojourning physically, rather than a physical person who loves spiritual things. Notice the big difference there? Profound difference in your consciousness. And now we start up the grand gallery, the hall of truth in light. Now knowing many of the truths, we are ascending in that beautiful massive gallery with the seven lapping stones over the side there for the seven spiritual centers. And we come up to this uh, top area over here. I have a little blow up. Now here's the grand gallery. We're coming up the hall of truth in light. Here's the great step. And Davidson noticed that in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, time was super condensed. One inch equaled one year over here. Now it equaled one month. Things were happening in one twelfth the speed that they used to happen. Things were happening very fast. He noticed that the first low passageway in which you had to bend down again was the great war to end all wars, World War I. And he thought, wow, this is amazing, the dating of these things. Here is the chamber of the triple veil, conscious mind, subconscious, and superconscious, moving into the universal consciousness. Then the dating of the next low passageway was 1928 to 1938, the beginning of the Great Depression and World War II. And right in the middle of the King's Chamber, World War II ends, 1945. Now Davidson and Aldersmith thought that when you hit this world wall, the world ended. Just like many of us thought the Mayan prophecy ended on December 21st, 2012, and so did the world. No, when Edgar Cayce was asked about this some 20 years later, he said, no, they were supposed to go up the wall. But Davidson and his partner had 1958 as the end right here. But let's go up the wall. Now, here we go. Here's the grand gallery, the great step over here, the triple veil chamber. We're coming through the low passageway into the king's chamber. There's the open tomb. That sarcophagus never had a lid on it, and it's larger than the entranceway. So the whole chamber was built around that sarcophagus. The concept that the tomb, the sarcophagus is open. There is no death. And then seven stones are laid above it to represent the seven ages. And we cycle back through them real quick just to make sure we really got it. That we understand and face all the weaknesses that brought us down we have them under control, and they have nothing in us again, so we can ascend. Now, Edgar says, go up the wall, one inch equals one month. You move your way up, and you can see how we're moving through. He said, every time you come into a stone, uh, it's a hard period. Every time you hit an air pocket there, and it's a, a buoyant, expansive period. Not necessarily... Uh, joyful and all, but a little bit expansion and uh, awareness uh, uh, and um, a breath for a moment or two, and then struggle again with issues. Notice that 2012 is right about in here, uh, coming out of this stone, moving then into the next stone and on up to the top two, which are limestone. These are granite, and these are limestone. Now he said from the uh, sarcophagus all the way to the top and the prophecy ends it's very hard to measure this exactly somewhere around 2038 2039 2037 somewhere around that you hit the apex and when you hit that case he says the prophecy in the Great Pyramid is over the old record in Giza is from the journey to the Pyrenees now that refers to the sinking of Atlantis, the final destruction of Atlantis, everybody had to migrate to higher land. The Pyrenees Mountains was one of the key places where ancient Atlanteans 
traveled to. And the Basque people have a language that has no root in any modern language that we use. So it may be a remnant of ancient Atlantis. To the death of the Son of Man as a man. So he sees the journey from the ancient period and the ancient times in which everything was self-pursuit and um, then a, a, a period of searching in which you stop thinking of yourself as a physical human being, but a celestial being, not a human, not a, a material a creature of terrestrial life. The death of the Son of Man as a man is a breakthrough, an awareness that uh, you might have something uh, more to you that lives long beyond the physical body. And then to 1998, 1998, which Casey saw as the beginning of the influence to the New Age. Giza is the place of the initiates and their gaining by personal application and by the journeys through various activities. A soul becomes conscious, aware of its contact with the universal cosmic God creative forces. Notice he hyphenates this to pull this all together to try to describe something that is often difficult for us to describe. The universal cosmic God creative forces in its experience by feeding upon the food, the fruits, the results of the spirit of God, of life, of reality. Colon, he lists them, love, Hope, kindness, gentleness, brotherly love, patience. Patience, he said, overcomes time and space. Patience is a characteristic of a celestial being, not a terrestrial, space-contained, time-oriented being. It breaks you out of that reality. These make for the awareness in the soul of its relationship to the creative forces that uh, are manifest, uh, is manifest in self, in the ego, in the I am of each soul, and the I am that I am, God's name that he gave to Moses when Moses asked for his name, that I am, that little I am, is me too, the Creator saying. The great I am put a little bit of itself, it's into us, and that essence, that sense of I am, in us is that gift from the Creator. Self-awareness, self-consciousness, and free will to use it to grow to become a companion with the Creator. The awareness is coming. This is Casey's prophecy about this Egyptian awareness. It is coming of the full consciousness, of the ability to communicate with or to be aware of the relationships to the creative forces and the uses of same in material environs. We are growing to that place, as the Mayans called it, the spirit of all living things. An awareness that we can communicate with the life forces, the creative forces, and understand our relationship with them and use them to live in the material environment in a more spiritually oriented, cosmically centered manner with a higher consciousness and a higher vibration. This awareness during the era or age in the age of Atlantis and Lemuria or Mu brought what? We had that as we descended from the heavens. That's why when we look around the planet and find ancient megalithic structures that we could hardly build and hardly orient as perfectly to celestial objects as the ancient ones did, we had that awareness when we were building those things, when we were descending out of the heavens. But it brought destruction to man. We did not have control of our desires, our cravings, our free will, our selfishness. Destruction to man and his beginning of the needs of the journey up through that of selfishness. What a long, painful journey that has been. Casey says this age that's coming we will have the ability to communicate and be aware of our relationship to the creative forces and be able to use them again. We just have to be careful not to misuse them as we did in Lemuria and Atlantis. 
The Egyptian prophecy began with an involution of spirit and mind into matter, then an evolution up through matter until souls regain the spirit consciousness they once possessed. And again they show seven ages. See how these two work together? The Mayan, Aztec, Toltec wisdom and vision of the whole story in and out. The seven cycle. The Egyptians, the same story. The hardships you have to go through to become aware again of your celestial nature and to uh, contain your urges in order to cooperate with the whole and then have the greater power of the celestial creative forces in you and through you to live and survive in this world. But the soul must become aware of that again and the human egocentric earthy self must die a little bit to make room for the true self, to birth the true self, have that second birth. Then the true self, there's nothing uh, innately wrong with the earth or with matter. It's more the orientation of what is dominant. The true self then can temporarily sojourn in a physical environment using creative forces. There's no problem with that. This is the prophecy of both the ancient Mayans, the ancient Egyptians, and it's very similar. The timing is a little different. 2012, 2038, but it's very close. There's a lot of transition going on, so they could overlap a little bit. 